Well, today's story is uh, most unusual. Well, I guess most of these stories are. A most unusual shark attack. These are true tales of my African adventures. May this inspire you, deter you, caution you, and above all, entertain you. Most people attacked by sharks are attacked legitimately in the ocean. A respectable place to be attacked by a shark. I managed at all odds to be attacked by a shark in a swimming pool and escaped without injury, but only just. In line with my nature, I had become a sometime shark fisherman as well as a conventional fisherman. It's a useless pursuit where one imagines a sense of power and achievement by hooking a huge marine predator, then using all one's might to land the animal, then let it go. What was that all about? Wisdom sometimes comes to the young, but in my case, some time was needed. My usual shark hunting ground was Natal, from the old West Street Pier outside the then aquarium in Durban to St. Lucia, where sharks abound, particularly the Zambezi or bull shark and robust ragged tooth sharks. What we enjoyed most was the St. Lucia environment on the northern Zululand coast, where several methods were used to angle for sharks. The method we preferred was to take the head of a dead grunter, a common and sought after angling fish, and hook this head on a 12-0 hook attached to 70 pound breaking strain seven strand cable. The cable, a biting trace, was attached to 800 meters to 1000 meters of 50 kilogram breaking strain line on a large center pin reel fixed to a stout rod. On an ideal day, we would swing the grunter's head and lob it into a deep channel near the beach and brace ourselves for the hookup. A leather pad worn as a rudimentary glove was used to break the reel. As once having hooked a shark, trying to break or control the reel with the palm of one's hand could cause extensive burns and injuries. I recall once leaving my leather braking pad behind and out of necessity having to use a friend's hat to control the reel. Plumes of smoke rose up from the smouldering hat as the friction of the revolving reel against the hat produced enough heat to cause a fire. To see the large triangular fin of one or more Zambezi sharks cut through the shimmering water as they crossed the sandbar, homing in on our bait in the channel, was enough to produce adrenaline for a decade. One day, whilst roaming the beach to locate a suitable channel, we encountered a tourist in difficulty and seemingly close to drowning. He was 80 to 100 meters from the shore and flailing about weakly, screaming periodically for help. His friends and family were mortified and stood in helpless terror on the beach facing this nightmare. There were no lifeguards here. The currents could be strong, the backwash treacherous. We knew the sea well. My friend had earned his life-saving certificate and I was a good fisherman and swimmer as well. We combined our respective talents. I hooked my 12-0 hook into his costume and he swam out to the tourist without any regard for himself. The idea was that if he encountered difficulties at any time during the rescue, he could grasp the trace wire and I could fish them both in. As it turned out, he was a good enough swimmer and he required no assistance from me and the tourist was helped to shallower water. The family swarmed over their rescued family member. We continued up the beach. No one really noticed. We were not looking for thanks or reward of any kind. We wanted to fish and he was safe. The annual trade fair in Goodwood in the Cape was looming and the organizers were happy, as usual, for us to erect our snake park. Once again it became a major attraction. This year, however, we had a twist. Live sharks were to be displayed as well, we announced, near the snake park. This was a hitherto unparalleled spectacle. 
I must have been 23 years old. We conducted some research into the establishment of an environment with minimum requirements for housing live sharks temporarily and were given much advice by aquariums and ichthyologists. Bull sharks and ragatoo sharks were most successfully housed in these conditions, but bull sharks were not present in false bay and there was no guarantee that we would capture a ragatoo shark. The other species we thought might survive for at least a short period was a bronze whaler, common in False Bay. A pool was sponsored, a 24 meter diameter plastic pool raised 1.4 meter above ground, intended to be a swimming pool, not a shark tank. An elaborate filter system was installed and the water was rendered saline using coarse sea salt to the specified requirement. The game was on. Now, what about the sharks? Everyone said, well, I was going to catch them, of course. All these doubting Thomases who thought I had not considered this most essential last detail, really. Two weeks before the commencement of the show, we embarked on our first short capturing expedition. We had a 1.5 ton truck, a tank, oxygen, a sling to lift the shark, help, and me, the purveyor of ocean sharks on demand. At Gordon's Bay and False Bay, Cape Town, the pilots who flew over the bay had often spoken of sharks being clearly visible from the air near the pier at the yacht basin. This we figured was to be our capturing ground. A bait shop on the bay, amongst other things, hired out a small rowboat at one rand per hour, a tiny amount of money. One whole South African rand, can you imagine that? My colleague would stand at the end of the concrete pier. This was Peter who saved my bacon on the night of the grizzly bear attack. A breakwater serving the yacht basin, I suppose that sounds a bit... Boom. My colleague would stand at the end of the concrete pier. This, by the way, was Peter, who saved my bacon on the night of the grizzly bear attack. The concrete pier was a breakwater serving the yacht basin, and I would hire the rowboat and row to the end of the pier. There I would tie a whole mackerel to my large hook and row out to sea, 400 to 500 meters. Peter would feed the line out from the reel. In the rowboat, I was a little cork on the ocean. At the right spot, the bait was dropped and I would return the boat. We then sat on the pier and waited and waited and waited. Success was not assured. On our next outing, my dear father accompanied me. I don't know why it was, but he always seemed to turn up at the worst possible time. On this day, he held the rod whilst I rowed the mackerel out to sea. I had said to him that in the event of a shark picking up the bait, he should do his best to control the reel, and I would be back as quickly as I could. I was returning down the long pier when a motorized boat skippered by a cowboy sped out of the yacht basin and passed the pier without consideration for fishermen or anything but himself. His boat picked up the fishing line and my father thought he had picked up a shark. He attempted to break the reel with his hand and ended up with deep burns and scars. Undeterred and wishing to aid me in my quest, he then held the reel against his trousers, nylon trousers, which melted as a result of the friction and melted into his flesh in deep wounds. Mercifully, the line snapped and he was relieved of his duty and further injury. I wasn't sure whether I should laugh or cry. I think I cried with laughter before I reached him and thanked him for his gallant efforts. We packed up for the day. I was growing concerned as the show was approaching and we had no booty, no shark. I might add, all through this, I had a full-time job and a young family. Our luck was to change. On our next outing, 
No father this time. I hooked into a large shark, a bronze whaler. Nearly an hour passed while I fought the shark in, to the point where I was absolutely exhausted, experiencing nausea from the final efforts. It was a monster around three meters long. People in the vicinity had heard of the fight before the shark was coaxed into the protected side of the breakwater. A throng of onlookers filled the entire pier. Soon the shark was at the spillway. We maneuvered the sling under his tired body and began lifting it up to the transportation tank. A member of the public who had volunteered to help grabbed hold of the sling where the shark's ample tail was hanging out. The shark suddenly thrashed about in the sling and gave the unwitting helper a clout of note on the side of his head, sending him flying off the end of the truck into the bay. I never got to thank the poor man. Once the shark was in the transportation tank, the engine roared and we were off. We had done it. At the showgrounds, we transferred the shark into the waiting aquarium and off he went, circling the pool again and again and again. Boy, were we chuffed. The show was two days away and already the newspapers had reported the presence of the shark on the showgrounds. The day before the grand opening of the show, the shark faltered. It stopped swimming and lay at the bottom of the pool, swimming only sporadically, then resting again. I was summonsed. I was desperate to keep the shark alive. Of course, we had no experience whatsoever and were really just acting out our fantasies at the expense of the poor creature. I decided to swim the shark. This meant stripping down, entering the pool, then taking hold of the dorsal and one lateral fin, then walking round the pool, forcing oxygen into the shark's mouth and over its gills. And in this way, the shark would not suffocate. I leapt into the pool and then it happened. The shark erupted from the bottom of the pool and came directly at me. Mouth open, jaw extended, Eyes rolled back and twisted half on its side. I knew I was going to get bitten. I was next to the incoming and outgoing pipe serving the filtration system. How I was quicker than the shark, I cannot tell. I grabbed the nearest pipe and vaulted out of the pool, the shark almost upon me. As my feet left the water, the shark broke water and clamped its jaws around the heavy-duty PVC pipes, severing all four of them and ripping a tear in the pool. Had the shark reached my body, infinitely more tender than the rigid piping, which he had severed, I would have sustained unthinkable injuries. Those observing the attack said the shark must be by a fraction and grabbed the pipes in my stead, shaking its head from side to side and cleanly removing the lot the shark died the next day.